everybody. JK here from Animator Island. Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, we're back with another study of different aspects of art so that I can continue to recraft my style into something different than it's been for the past 30 years. So uh, today we're going to be talking about chunkiness and form, which we'll get into in a bit. But before we start, I did want to make one quick note. Uh, just Something that happened over the past week, uh, past couple days, that I wanted to uh, chat about because I think it's very important for all artists to realize. After we did the last live stream, which was on line quality, I put all my notes into my general files and things, and then I started preparing the lecture for today on chunkiness and form. Well, an interesting thing happened because partway through the preparation for that lecture, I realized that now we have three things, essentially, that I need to keep in mind when I'm continuing to develop my style. And initially, it was just character proportions. That was the first thing that we talked about. And character proportions are very mathematical and measured. I mean, it doesn't have to be full math, but you could tell there's, there's a distance between the uh, torso and the pelvis. There's a distance of the top of the head to the feet things like that. So it's very understandable for me. I've worked with it for a very long time and it, I'm no stranger to it. So everything was fine and dandy. Then we moved on to line styles and in line styles, uh, you know, I, I have a very good grasp of, of line quality and weight and things like that. It's, it's not something I maybe have practiced a ton because my background was in a style that was like very newspaper comic style. And so the lines were very consistent, but I understood it. I, everything, you know, all good. Oh, good there too. Well, now we move on to chunkiness and form. And that's more of a three-dimensional quality to drawing. And that is something I have very little experience with because even though I'm an animator, I've always worked in a very graphical way and it's usually been pretty flat. And as a result, while I was preparing this lecture on chunkiness and form, I felt I started to feel a little bit overwhelmed because it was like, okay, I could handle proportion, I can handle line quality, but now that we're on to this topic that I struggle with, oh my gosh, this feels like too much. And we're only on to the third thing and there's, there's just gonna be a lot to discuss. So what I kind of wanted to do is start today's uh, video uh, live stream by reminding everybody that that's gonna happen, right? You're gonna feel overwhelmed by this some of the time because art is very big and very complex. And even when you get very good at it, it's still very hard some days and you, you will feel this, this overwhelming sense. So how to deal with that? Well, for me, the first step is to step back, is to stop for a minute, get out of my own head and say, you know what, this is okay. I mean, I'm learning something new or, or trying some new things. It's gonna be okay because it is, it's gonna be okay. And the second thing to do is to recognize that you don't have to do it all at once, right? This is a process. Your whole career, your whole life when you're doing art is going to be a process. You're not going to be able to just jump in and do exactly what you want in the beginning. Now, for me, it's a little bit different because, you know, 40 years into it, I'm, I feel like I'm starting over in some ways. So there's, there's this little bit of extra emotion to it because of that aspect, but it's still the same thing. Yeah, I might be starting over, essentially. I, I start over with a with a foundation, but it's okay. You know, we'll get there. We're just gotta, gotta take it one day at a time and, and it'll be okay. So I just wanted to mention that before we jumped into today's lecture. And uh, that with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get to it. So as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about chunkiness and form. And this past week I had the opportunity to have a conversation with my wife who is a software engineer. So all this sort of stuff is foreign to her because that's not her world. And so she asked me, what does chunkiness mean? <laughs> and I said, well, um, so like, well, you know, uh, what well, it's, and I didn't have a very good answer. <laughs> so that was a very good opportunity for me because if you can't define something well, for somebody who has no idea what you're talking about, that means that you need to go back and really analyze it a little bit more and make sure that you understand the topic yourself. So here's what I came up with, and it happened to be related to things that were kind of 
around the house uh, where we were having this conversation. For starters, this is an egg. Uh, this is a Ukrainian egg, which is one of the other art forms that I do, and my wife actually also does, because there's a lot of geometry involved, so she wraps her brain around it much better than I in that regard. But ignoring the pattern on it, uh, you can see that this egg is perfectly smooth, right? It's spherical in shape. It's egg-shaped, but it's, it's essentially a sphere that's elongated. But it's got no real faces. It's got no real planes to it. It's just a perfectly smooth egg. On the other hand, this is a D20, which you may recognize if you played Dungeons and Dragons at all. Uh, I don't get to play very often anymore because it takes a lot of time and I don't have that much time. But if you take a look at this D20 or any D20 that happens to be laying around your house, you will note that it is also generally spherical in shape and in form but it's got a bunch of planes, which is necessary because you're rolling it and then seeing what number comes up on top. But all these different planes are like somebody hacked off pieces of the sphere, because if you put those, those extra planes, or those extra pieces back on, you would end up with a sphere that is very close to a very smooth egg. But this D20 is more along the lines of what I would talk about when I'm talking about chunkiness right? Chunkiness and form. You see the planes, you see the changes, you see edges of not necessarily line, right? We're not talking about line because technically it's just one color versus another color. And the reason that the color is different is because we have a light source coming in. So even though the entire D20 is one color, the light changes that color. So we see the different planes of the D20. So that's kind of what we're talking about today when we're talking about chunkiness and form. And I'm going to go ahead and share my iPad now because I've got an image that to me represents this extremely well. And that's this one here. So if we take a look at this image as we jump into today's lecture on chunkiness and form, you will see that it is very chunky, right? Uh, we have these forms and these shapes that play off one another that give this dimensional quality to them. So just for example, uh, let's take a look at this nose, right? We have what is essentially this shape and it's a pretty flat shape to be honest. I mean, we have a little bit of highlight on one edge but it's, very, it's relatively flat. And then we have other flat shapes next to it. So like this, this is a relatively flat shape. And then this is kind of a shape and then we have maybe this that's a little bit of a shape. And then we have this plane up here that's a shape. And when we take all of these shapes together and then we, you know, have different light sources and, and different tones, we get this chunky quality that gives a sense of dimension and gives a sense of solid drawing in a way. And we're not really using lines here, though there are lines in aspects of this. But this is the sort of thing that we're going to be talking about today, this sort of chunky quality. Now, one thing that I do want to note is that I'm not necessarily looking to have my art style be this, right? This is where it's a little different. The proportion to, uh, lecture and, and analysis that we did was very, um, very directly applicable, essentially. Uh, Alex says hi. Hey, Alex, welcome to the live stream. But... And then the line quality analysis that we did was also very applicable. Like I wanted to incorporate those things directly into my style. With chunkiness and form, it's almost like a secondary element. I don't want the focus to be that chunkiness and form. For this piece that we see on the screen here right now, this is very chunkiness and form forward, right? But that's not what I'm looking for. I want to kind of incorporate this as a background element, not in the background, but as an element that kind of is subtle compared to something like this. Now, I really love this piece. If I could do something like this, I'd be pretty pleased, but that's not really what I'm shooting for when it comes to style, my own style going forward. What we're going to try and do, and we'll see some examples of this later, is we're going to try and see how we can blend this sort of chunkiness in with a more traditional style and that sort of thing. Ferdinand's around. Hey, Ferdinand. Says, awesome topic, just stopping by briefly. 
So everybody can wave to Ferdinand, uh, who I believe is out and about today. So I'm glad he got to stop by and uh, we'll have to do another joint stream together again soon. All right. So continuing along with chunkiness and form, we're going to move on to this image, which I found, and I believe it was by Proko. Forgive me to the original artist if it's not, but I think that that's where I found it. And it says here, drawing tip, train to simplify what you see. Imagine it sculpted with a large chisel with flat planes. And this is a great visual example of this sort of chunkiness that I'm talking about. You see the planes. Now the pair on the left, which is a real pair a photograph, is it, it doesn't necessarily scream, I have a bunch of planes, right? But if you look at it very carefully and you analyze it, what you'll see is the uh, version on the right here is kind of what would happen if you took that chisel and you made it very uh, plane heavy, right? That chunky style. Now, another interesting thing about this is you could give it even more of a chunkier style if you reduce the amount of planes, because even now, the image on the right here has a lot of planes. So it's very smooth in that sense. Instead, what we can do, and we'll just do a rough drawing and forgive me. Well, actually, let me turn this to my favorite sketching color, which is a dark purple. I don't know why I like that color, but I do. I'll go back to Tinderbox. But if we, uh, we're gonna do just a quick rough sketch and it won't be perfect, but that's okay because we're just doing a rough sketch. And so if we kind of just get an idea of the basic forms of this pair, somewhere in this neighborhood, what we'll see is that we can take this down to even less planes than the one on the right here. So if we wanted to break it down to even fewer planes, we would probably still start with something at the top because it's kind of its own plane up at the top here. And then we could break it down so that Mostly the shadow area would be kind of one plane here. And then the, the pair kind of comes out a little bit. So it would be a little like this because uh, it's got that kind of jutting out in the middle there. And then we would come down and there's going to be a bottom plane. I'm not, yeah, we'll see some of that bottom plane uh, a little bit like that. And so we can, as you can see here, we could break it down into almost even chunkier forms, right? This is an even chunkier version of the the pair that we see here. And then if we wanted to, we could go in and put in the different shading elements because that would be a really good exercise too. We would essentially make sure that the darker areas are going to be darker. And then uh, I, I'm doing that with opacity, but something like that. Right. This is an exercise we can do, and it's a great exercise if you want to practice that sort of form and chunkiness. I'm stupidly cleaning this up because it doesn't matter. I just leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, hair on the iPad. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what I'm talking about regarding the sort of planes and chunkiness and form and that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll move along. Here we have a couple other images that I found that I think really represent this well. This center image is nice because it's almost a sphere. It's like our, our D20, right? Uh, this one is more of more of a, a, I'm not sure. I'm just sure what, how many sides that would technically have, but this is more of a, D, a D12 or, or something along those lines. But at any rate, you have the sphere and if you, chunk, uh, if you chopped off sides to create these chunky planes, this is what you would get. And it shows you how the lighting would change and then what you would call the different planes. And so it's very, it's, I think a really helpful image to look at. On the left here, we see some faces that have been turned into planes. Now faces are a fascinating thing to look at when it comes to this idea of chunkiness and form. The face, you know, if you look at your own face, uh, unless you're particularly grizzled, you don't, you don't necessarily have these very distinct planes right? Everything is very soft because you've got a lot of, of muscles and, and fat and skin and all this good stuff on top of your face. So you really have to um, look hard if you want to find the face, uh, the planes of the face. Now, the good news is there's a lot of resources out there if you want to take a look at this. Some are 3D models like the ones that you see on the screen here. Some are 2D drawings, all sorts of stuff. You can find that. One thing that I will say, if you're going to practice 
trying to find planes and forms on the face. Be very careful that you don't look too much. Well, you should look at them too, but don't try and do it initially on very well and evenly lit images. What I mean by that is sometimes when someone is taking a, a professional photograph, they want the lighting to be very even, right? If you look at uh, just the lighting that I have here today, there is light coming in one direction from the window. That's more of a natural daylight. And then we have this light coming in over here from a softbox that's hopefully lighting the scene better than if I didn't have that on. And as a result, you're seeing a lot more shadows. But if I was professionally lighting this for, say, uh, you know, a portrait, I might instead put several soft boxes around so that everything is very smooth and even. It makes people look elegant. It makes people look prettier uh, in general because it's smoothing out some of those rough edges. But when you're doing uh, practice on planes and things, what you want is more harsh lighting. And I'll use the word harsh there, but you want more dramatic lighting, right? Because then you'll be able to get those harder shadows and you'll be able to see, oh, this stops basically right here. And this, this goes in here and that sort of thing. So that's going to serve you well, especially in the beginning, if you're practicing this. Uh, creator 2D says, love from India, love back from the US. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I'm glad, glad you showed up to, to hang out for a while. So uh, that's that's kind of the face. And then if we look over here to the right, you will see some animals. Uh, interestingly, this one at the bottom, I'm pretty sure it's not actual paper. I think it's a 3D model done in the style of paper. But this one at the bottom is very interesting because it made me it reminded me of origami because that's the style that it's in. And I hadn't really considered that before. Origami is is very much this idea of chunkiness and form because you see every single plane it's a folded piece of paper so paper craft in general could be a good source for uh, learning about this sort of thing now uh one thing that i would talk about there is you have to be careful because origami is very representational right so if you make an origami crane for example because that's a very well-known one it's not going to look exactly like a crane. It really isn't. It's a representation of a crane. And that's fine. Uh, we just need to know that going in so that you're not, because uh, it can, what can happen is we can confuse the, the symbolism, you know, the symbolic with what actually is. The most popular, I think, way to think about that is if you think of a very young child who does a picture of some exterior scene and they put a sun up in the corner right and that sun is a circle like this with some lines coming out right like that that sun is just a representation of the sun the actual sun looks nothing like that i once had the opportunity to volunteer on a farm for a summer and i ran into fascinating people there but one person was a teacher and she was adamant that no one learned to draw a sun like that she was like, nobody should look. That's not what a sun looks like. Nobody should draw like that. And I understood what she was saying. But I think initially when you're a child, it's OK to use some of that that symbolic art, uh, even when you're older, as long as you know what you're doing. But you kind of need to give them easy wins at the beginning, like <laughs> to sit a kid down and be like, OK, we're going to draw the sun. But I want it in a totally realistic style. That's just not feasible given their dexterity levels at that age. So it's okay to have that symbolism, but you just want to make sure that you're aware of the difference between that and the real thing, uh, in a sense. Continuing along, if we look down at the image at the bottom, uh, this beaver craft, we will see a large cat, right? Um, probably like a panther or something. And this is in process of being carved out of wood. And this is another place that's an excellent resource to start to see this idea of chunkiness and this idea of planes, because typically, not always, but typically, if someone is doing a sculpture, they will begin with things like the base forms and the planes. And then slowly over time, they're going to add detail and they're going to round things out and things like that. And that's something that we can really take away in things like drawing and uh, art in general. If you start with your base forms, your big things, and then you slowly kind of chip away at it, 
you can make sure that everything's in the right place. You can make sure there's dimensionality to it, things like that. And it's a really an interesting way to work. So I've been working that way a lot more recently. Continuing, we see some uh, 3D forms of characters from animation. Uh, the middle one is obviously 3D rendered. And then Scar on the left is Clay. And I think that's Mr. Incredible on the right. And he's also Clay. But if we look at Scar here for a minute, we can see that this has a lot of rounded forms, right? But at the same time, we can tell where there are some planes, right? So this is one plane right there. And this is one plane. So you have a little bit of this chunkiness that I'm talking about. Uh, here's a plane. Here, you can see this shape right here with the shadow. That's a nice plane right there. And so when we start to analyze and start to look at it, we can see where this chunkiness is coming from. And again, sculpture is a terrific place to take a look at this stuff and uh, and kind of analyze. The 3D form that we have here, again, there's elements that are very smooth. They're just very rounded and smoothed out. But at the same time, this artist made some elements extremely defined. Like in the hair here, we have a very defined plane and shape. It's it's very harsh, but it's it adds that dimensional quality. And the same in the nose, we have this plane that is just very bold and very graphic. And around the eyes here, that's very bold and very graphic. But then you have other areas like this, which is much more smooth and rounded, right? Like we have all these different rounded forms. And so that's a different thing too. Uh, Runkumar says, hi. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the live stream. All right, let's get rid of those lines. I could just delete them all at once, but anyway. And then, so we go over to Mr. Incredible here. And this one is, I think, one of the most fascinating to look at because most of it is rounded. And then there are a few elements where it's very angular and very sharp, right? So the nose here, is just extremely sharp and extremely heavy on this chunkiness and form. But everything else is very rounded. And, and even this plane, which is kind of sharp, it, it's, a, it's a more rounded form. And this cheek is extremely rounded. And then you have the head that's very rounded and things like that. So, well, thanks for subscribing. I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying the stream so far. Uh, check it over on the chat there. So. Hopefully that gives you an idea of this in, in that 3D model sort of form. Let's look at some 2D art next because we can apply the same chunkiness and form there. Uh, this piece on the left, you can see, again, has that element of kind of combining the chunkiness with uh, a smooth elements. So the face tends to have a lot of smooth areas in this particular piece. But then in other areas, like say this ear, we have a very distinct shape and form. And then this part of the ear is receded. It's definitely more of a 3D form. And this actually may be a 3D model. I'm not sure, but it has a quality to it that makes me feel like it's 2D. So I, I just brought it in. Uh, you could easily do this sort of, well, I, not easily. You can, very difficult, but you can do this in 2D alone. Um, Azure says, so like low poly computer models with the earlier examples. Yes, to a degree, you have to watch there because a lot of low poly computer models these days are amazing. <laughs> it's not like the old days where it was blatantly uh, planes. But yes, uh, that's another example. I didn't include any of those just because when I went searching for them, there's such a variety. So if you search for low poly computer models, you'll find some that are just beautifully smooth, even if they're low poly, but you'll also find some that have this sort of chunkiness to them. But that's a great example. And yeah, definitely glad you brought that up. If we look at this uh, squid with a hat and uh, spyglass, which I really dig, I, I like this just for the weirdness of it. I enjoy this, but this is a cool one because it also has that element of blending the two. So we have like, especially on the hat here, this hat has that chunkiness that's just so lovely and we see the plane changes and it's very dimensional, right? But then if we look down here into the face area, well, there's still some of this chunkiness, but it's not nearly the same uh, quality as that chunkiness around the hat. So it's kind of got that blend of both, which is really nice. And then lastly, down here, I found this, it says anatomy for sculptors. So that might be a place to look at. I don't, 
I don't, uh, I'm not endorsing the site. I actually didn't visit the site. I just found this as I was poking around, but they have a really cool example because they took a photograph and then they went in and they showed you where the different planes are and the different forms, which is a really cool thing. Even this seashell butt is weird, but <laughs> interesting. Um, so you can see, see the different planes and see the different forms and the sort of different, different stuff about that. Um, so then we have a question. What about high poly computer models? Will it be smooth? Uh, not automatically, probably, but if you were shooting for a very planar style, you can you can use a ton of, of polygons to get that effect. Typically speaking, the higher the poly count, the smoother things are going to be, but not always, not always, especially now that people are becoming really good at uh, uh, working in low poly style. Like there's just some amazing stuff out there. I definitely recommend if you get a chance, go search some images of low poly style. There's some incredible Sim I don't want to say simplistic, but it's it's very simplified art that's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, really good. All right. Let's take a look at this. Here we have kind of the opposite. Okay. So little story. The other day, Ferdinand and I were doing a live stream together, and we're working on a, a project together, this animated short, um, which you can, I'll link to the video where we are talking about the short in the description of the recording. So if you wanna check that out after, head over to YouTube, uh, the Animator Island channel, and you can check the description there. But essentially we were talking and drawing at the same time and things, and somebody asked about this story problem that they were having. And so we were analyzing and we were talking about it and just kind of talking through things. And one thing that we came across is the idea of opposites, right? So what we said was, if you take a look at the opposite the thing that you don't want, sometimes it's very helpful for clarity purposes, right? So at any given moment, you at least have two options. You have your first initial idea or option, and then you have its complete opposite. And you might not want to use its opposite, but if you recognize what the opposite is, it can help develop the thing you do want to do. So I put together this slide because these are three examples of beautiful art that I really like. They're in my art gallery collection, but they don't represent at all this chunkiness and style aspect of things that I want to implement. So if we take a look at these here, you can see that the forms are very smooth. They're very nicely rendered, but they're very smooth. Now there are some areas like in this one where we have that plane change, right? In this little spot here, we have that plane change. In the lips here, you can see some plane changes. So it's not that they've abandoned it entirely. It's just that they went for a very smooth and very pleasant style in that regard. If we look at the center one, it's the same sort of thing. This is very beautifully rendered, but it doesn't have that chunkiness. And that's good to know. Again, there are some elements of it. If you look at the hair, there's some elements of chunkiness in it. Uh, you might even get away with saying some of the apple is, but it's very... Uh, it's very well rendered and it's very blurred, so it's harder to tell there. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we will look at something like this and we say, oh, I really like this, but it's also not what I'm shooting for right now. It's not what I'm attempting to do. And so that allows me to look at the differences between this and one of the more chunky pieces and then start to pull and figure out exactly what it is that I'm after. And then this last one, which I really love, uh, it's just pleasant. It's pleasing for me to look at. I really like it, but <clears throat> there's, there's no chunkiness here. <laughs> um, I was, uh, the only place you could find chunkiness is in this cliff, right? This is, this is kind of chunky, but that is it. Everything else is very graphic and smooth and pretty and nice. And I, I, again, I love this picture. This is the sort of thing that I'd probably hang on my wall, but while we're talking about chunkiness and form, this is kind of the opposite. And I think that it's useful to know that. Uh, let's see, we got a comment. Those pictures are smooth, but not very glare, or is it? It's confusing. Uh, by glare, do you mean uh, the lighting? Or I'm not exactly sure what you mean by glare, um, but they are very smooth and they typically are much more evenly lit, right? So we're, we don't have a very harsh direct light. Now in this one, in the middle one here, we kind of have this direct backlight that's coming through. 
it's giving us this kind of halo effect but it's not it's on the hair specifically so you're not getting that plane change um the good news is uh if you're interested in this sort of thing and lighting we do have a live stream coming up soon ish probably hopefully that is strictly on lighting. We're going to tackle lighting specifically, and we're going to talk about all those aspects, which should be very interesting. All right, our last slide here, and then we're going to move into the application and analysis. Here are four images that I pulled that I think do a lovely job of combining both chunkiness and form and a smoother quality or a more graphic quality or a line quality or something like that. So if we go through them one at a time, you will see here that this first piece, first of all, is very graphic and very illustrative. Uh, it's not shooting for realism, but it's got a beautiful realistic element because of how well it's crafted. But if you look at, for example, her hand here, I mean, it's stylized such that it is literally just a chunky form by itself. Um, it's really nice. And it also has a highlight on it. And then if you look at, uh, well, the other hand, if you look at things like the sleeve, we have this element of kind of chunkiness. You see all these little shapes that define different forms. Now this smooths it out a little bit, but it's still got that, that chunkiness to it, that quality, that element. And then uh, at the same time, you can look down at like the food. The food is much more smooth, uh, smoothed out and rounded. We don't have nearly as much of that chunkiness. We still have a little bit because you could see, you know, a little bit of plane shifts, but it's not as extreme as the rest of the piece. So it's not, it's not going to be quite the same uh, depth in that sense. But it's nice to have both in this piece. Now, this piece does not use line. And interestingly, when we talked about line quality, and I mentioned that one thing I want for my own style is to use line for sure. A lot of the pieces that I found that have that chunky quality do not use line which I thought was very interesting. Instead, they used these planes to define shapes and form. So they got away with not using line, which is very nice, but still I wanna use line. So I need to find a way to combine the two. And so that's something that I need to keep in mind. Uh, Dylan's here. Hey, Dylan, I says hi in the chat. Glad you could join us today. All right, looking at this piece, in terms of chunkiness and form, we can see it a lot in like the legs. We have this beautiful graphic quality and. I know we're not talking about color today, but this one, I just really appreciate how how pushed they made the color. Like they really went for it. And that's a very cool thing. But we have this chunkiness, this form. And then the, the area that I see it most in is this sort of dress, uh, the way it's coming up. You can you could you could connect the lines like you could find the forms in here. And it's it's beautifully done. Here, let me move it over so that you can see. You could find those forms and it's chunky and beautiful and it's really nicely done. So I really like that aspect. And uh, again, we're looking at some a piece that does not have line. So we have to move along because I definitely want to use line, but that's something to keep in mind. This one is nice because again, we have elements of very smooth transitions, but then we have elements where you can see the plane shifts and things like that. The area here, on her chest is nice because it has that direct uh, change of plane, right? It's very defined. It's got that chunky quality. The hair has that chunky quality to it. This, uh, whoops, this um, fuzzy sleeve thing also has these planes that are very distinct and very graphic and bold. And it's really nice to have, uh, to see that sort of thing. And then again, you have elements that are much smoother, which is nice to have that blend. And then this last one, which might be my favorite piece of them all here, and at least on this page, this one's just so pleasing to me. I love the weird little bird on her head. The, the expression is beautiful. The proportions of her face are lovely. The hair, this is just dreamy to me. I love this. I could just look at this kind of one all day. Um, and if I do something like this, I will be very pleased with myself. But <laughs> Ignoring that for a moment, as I could just gush forever. If we look at, for her, uh, for example, her face, we see that nice smooth quality, those smooth uh, rounded forms. There's not a lot of harshness there, which lends to her, her, I don't say beauty, it lends to her, uh, this, this feminine, elegant quality to her. But then we go down and we look at this amazing sleeve 
this big bulky chunky sleeve that is so nice look at these forms like the plane shifts this this little shape here is so pleasing like it's so nice and appealing and i love this and then we have you know you could see this plane and this plane and it's got these planal qualities and then this is rounded but it's a distinct plane and so this one is i think a great example of blending the two between that sort of chunkiness and that sort of smooth quality so i hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about when it comes to chunkiness and form we are going to move along next to the application and analysis. Obviously, we did a bunch of analysis here, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at some of the pieces from my personal style direction category thing, uh, which is this one. So we're gonna look at these pieces today, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some things regarding chunkiness and form for the for application in my future style. Uh, as you may have heard, if you were in a previous live stream, I am changing my style after 30, 30 years. I'm trying to anyway. We'll see if it works. And I want to go with an intentional direction. And as I said earlier in this stream, I'm trying to incorporate elements of chunkiness without going overboard and making it all chunky. So a lot of these are much more what I would call all chunky, but we kind of need to analyze that aspect of things so that we can determine what it is about it that, that does that. Each of these pieces are in my 108, I think it's 108, somewhere in that neighborhood, 108 album, uh, image album of the direction I want to head, some element of the direction. I had thousands and thousands of images that I had collected over, over time that I really loved. And then I went through those thousands of images and I pulled down to just 100 or so of them. And these ones are from that collection. So let's start up in the corner here with this one. All right, first of all, one thing to note here is that we've got line. Beautiful line, hooray, line has, has come back. This piece is done with a very textured line and it's done very subtly with line, but you can tell that there's still line, for example, in her nose here, it's defined with line. Whereas if we look at her lips, this is just, plane changes. There's, there's no line here. They didn't put in a hard line. One thing to note that I think is useful to know is that if you want to, or when you're doing a face, if you're struggling with the lips, one of the things that may be the problem is that you're relying too heavily on line because the lips tend to have uh, more just form and, and they're soft, right? And line tends to make things harder. So if you want an edge to be soft, typically you don't want to put a hard line in there. You might be able to get away with a light line, but typically you'll just want to change the coloring and things like that. That's not exclusively true. There are people who can draw beautiful lips in full line, but if you're struggling with it, try reducing the amount of line because it will soften the lips and it'll soften any area that you want to feel a little less uh, severe. So just a quick tip there. Okay, so continuing with this piece, one thing that you will note uh, that I really like, I don't think I would use it in my default style, but I'd love to play around with it, is that this artist used shading of crosshatching in all sorts of different colors and things as part of their uh, shading and part of their defining of planes, right? Which I really appreciate. That's a very cool way to do it. And this piece is just so elegant. We can see this chunkiness, especially in her lips. These are so three-dimensional. The nose has that element of chunkiness to it. Uh, just, they went, they did not shy away from straight lines in this piece, right? There are very straight lines and there are very defined changes uh, all along this piece. Now, the same thing could have been done where they smoothed everything out really nicely. Like we could have made this very smooth and we could have smoothed that. And, made this more rounded and you know we could have done that the, the artist could have done that and it would have still been a beautiful piece but they didn't shy away from really going for it with uh straight edges so i think that's something that we can think about for a second straight edges seem to indicate a plane change and in a sense uh, that 
that harshness almost lends itself to this. And, and forgive me, because I'm thinking on the fly here. This is just an idea that just popped into my head. So I'm trying to think through it with you live. But this this idea of of like straighter lines probably lends itself to that chunkiness, right? Because if we had round lines, it's going to automatically smooth things out in a way. So that's very interesting. So I'm going to I'm going to jot that down. And then we'll put a question mark because we got to still think about that. But um, that's something interesting that I hadn't considered before. One more thing I want to talk about regarding this piece, and this is a general art thing. Notice how at the bottom of the piece, there is very little uh, in terms of detail. There's very little in terms of chunkiness. There's very little of everything. The reason the artist did this is because their focus, the thing they want you to look at is up here in the face. Generally speaking, if you're doing a portrait, that's where you want your audience to look, right? In the face. That's going to be the main center of attention because that's where you, well, typically that's where you'll look when you're meeting somebody for the first time. You look at their face. Uh, if they have a particular form or figure, you may be distracted by other elements of them. But that's, you know, that's just an old saying, my eyes are up here. That's because that's typically where you look at somebody. So this artist specifically added less detail at the bottom. I, I shouldn't say, I'm kind of assuming that because this is really nice art and I don't think they just ran out of time and didn't, didn't finish. I think that they meant it to be that way. But if you want people to look at a certain place, that's one way to do it. Put the detail there, put the, the contrast, put the focus in that area, and then put less focus and less detail and just less form in other places, it will still read. Like you can still tell that big white shape at the bottom is her shoulder. It's not like the, the artist did nothing there. It's not just a floating head, but they put a lot less detail in there because they wanted to draw your eye up into the face. And the same goes for the hair. If you look at the hair here, the hair is very rough and, and kept rough on purpose so that you look at the place that is not kept rough that is kept very pretty and very well done. And so that's a, an element that you want to talk about and think about when you're doing your own work. All right, moving on to this middle piece. What we have here is a very cartoony style, which is nice. Now, when I bring out a cartoony style in one of my uh, examples of, of what I want to shoot for, it's a struggle for me just personally as an artist. It's a struggle because my style is already very cartoony because I wanted to be a newspaper comic uh, artist. So when I see a very cartoony style, I may like it, but there's almost this red flag that gets thrown up for me because suddenly I'm like, oh wait, don't fall back into those old habits. <laughs> Even though this is vastly different because it's filled with dimension and appeal than what I would have done previously. So that's just something that goes through my head. When I sit, sit down and see or analyze a cartoony piece, I have to remind myself to kind of find that balance between a little more realism and, a, and that sense of lightheartedness that comes with something more cartoony because I'm still gonna do cartoony work, especially some of the time because that's what we do for Weekend Panda games, the video games that I make are gonna be in that cartoony style typically. So I still need those skills. I just wanna make sure that I find that right balance. Anyway, if we continue on with this cool cactus character, the petals around his face, you can see are extremely chunky and they use line, which is really nice. But you'll see that one way that they get around that is that they use some line, for example, here, and then areas where they don't use line, which is very neat to see. So you're going to need to, or I, if you're trying to do this like me, you will need to find that blend of where to put line and where to leave line out. Because if you're trying to blend both, then there's going to need to be areas where you include the line and where you don't. And just in general, this has some really nice dimensional qualities. If you look at this rope, it's really nice. You see these chunky elements and it, it feels bulky. Like it feels bulky. Same, same with the petals again. These petals feel bulky, which is a really nice uh, aspect of this work. And then I think 
you know, more than anything, maybe this crystal at the top of his staff has that chunky quality. And typically crystals will have a lot of chunky quality. Um, oh, so Mio says, hi, is this live streaming or pre-recorded? Well, now you know it's definitely live, uh, live streaming because I answered your question as it happened, but there will be a recording. So you might be watching this afterwards recorded, but welcome to the stream. It is live streamed. And uh, if you have any questions beyond, is this live streamed? You're welcome to ask them. Otherwise, there will be a Q&A at the end where we can chat about all sorts of stuff. All right. Uh, what I was going to say there regarding the crystal is crystals are a great place to look at this chunky and form aspect of things because crystals tend to be very plain or planar, plain or they usually have a lot of planes, right? And they're very distinct in the amount of planes and where they are and the lighting and things like that. So crystals are a great Great place to look if you're interested in that sort of thing. Okay, this beautiful piece that we started with, we kind of already went over. Uh, again, we can see this this sculpted chunky elements. They're all over the place. It's really nice. Uh, even the hair, which typically is smooth, has this chunky quality. It's just a really, really great piece. Again, this isn't what I'm shooting for in my own work. This is just an example of that quality that I want to, to be able to include. So uh, we'll move on from that because we kind of already covered him. This piece down here, this caricature, is a great example of the usage of line and chunkiness, right? This one has a lot of line in it, which is very nice. The other tricky bit of business for me about this piece is that the coloring is such that it appeals to me because it's unique and different and pulls me in because I'm like, oh, that's weird. Like, look, he's got this very strange aquamarine skin and this red nose and the red ear. And it's and look at the lighting is yellow and his eyes are yellow. And so those aspects can be tricky because while we're analyzing chunkiness and form, again, color might get in the way a little bit. Um, but we'll ignore that for a minute. And we look again at these things. One interesting thing about this, now that we've kind of continued our discussion from before, is that there are a lot of straight lines here. There are a bunch of curved lines, but there are a lot of straight lines. So that element may, may really be uh, a key feature of getting that chunkiness in there. That's interesting. Uh, but I really like this piece, and I think that it does a nice job at combining line and that sort of chunkiness. Uh, this piece, on the other hand, has no line. Uh, pretty much at all. But it's so soft and fuzzy while remaining chunky. Now, that's mostly done through texture work, right? If you had this same piece and it was either line or hard edges, it would not feel nearly as fuzzy. But that's okay. It's okay to use that sort of texture effect for to the your advantage because here you have these fuzzy puppies and you just want to go and hug them. Like, I just want to run over there and just hug them because they are adorable. But we have still, in spite of just using texture, this chunky element. These are fuzzy puppies, but they're they're bulky fuzzy puppies. And we get that through some of this chunkiness, even though it's it's got these fuzzy edges, you can still feel where there are planes. Like there's a plane here and there's a plane here. And so this is a really neat example because it, doesn't initially feel as hard and as harsh as some of the other ones we've looked at, but it still has that element of, of chunkiness to it, which I really appreciate. Again, I'm not looking to do illustrations like this. I'm probably, it would surprise me if I ever do a piece that looks anything like this, because this isn't just, it's just not what I'm looking for. I don't want to go heavy texture and things like that, but you never know. Maybe one day I'm experimenting and I do it. All right. This piece, I think, is very interesting. And the reason that I find this very interesting is it's one of my pieces. I did this skull in 2022 as a, an exercise. And as I was going through my thousands of images, without like after a while, if you're going through thousands of images, you part of your brain kind of shuts off and, and you're just going by instinct, I guess, alone. And so when I came across this image, I was like, oh, I really like that. 
And then my immediate next thought was, oh my gosh, I did that. <laughs> so the reason that it's in here is firstly, because I like it and it uh, incorporates some of that element. But I did want to talk for a second regarding this, because there's, there's another aspect of art that we can discuss here. And that is kind of, how do I put it? Sometimes you're going to hate the work you do, but sometimes something's going to shine through that says, yes, that's it. That that's what I wanted to do. Uh, that shows me that I can do this. And so for me, this piece goes beyond just, this is sort of what I want to incorporate. For me, this is like a victory on the page. I can look at this and say, I did that. And yeah, there's some issues with it. And yeah, I could probably do it better today than I could last year even, but it means that there's hope almost like, you know, that, you know what I mean by that? It means that there's, there's a chance You're saying there's a chance. So little victories like that, if you collect together some of the pieces that you love, that you've done, they give you that sense of, I could do this. And then when you have a bad drawing day, because those happen, then you can kind of go back and say, no, this is just one of those days, you know, and that happens and it, and it encourages you not to quit um, because that can, that can happen. There's a reason that most people are not artists. Most people quit art at like age five. Why? Well, because it's hard, but also because it, it's, it's easier to quit than it is to keep going, right? So little things like this can help you. All right, I'll stop rambling about that aspect. Let's talk about this in terms of that quality of chunkiness. Now you can see that there are definitive forms here. There are definitive shadows. And some of them, like this area and like this area, are kind of a zigzag pattern to indicate that there's a little more smoothness in there. And then some of them are very harsh, like, like in this area, right? Or, or over here, we see these very harsh lines and harsh shadows. So it's a kind of a combination of both, which is nice. Here, I've also included line, which is great. That means that, you know, it's possible. I think that there are some mistakes. So if we could analyze for a second, some of the mistakes that this artist made, aka me, this area, is probably this line specifically is probably a mistake. I should have either, either lightened that line or probably left it out entirely. Now it's possible that this was on the reference, like there was a crack, but this crack is too deep. It's it's distracting from the overall piece. Uh, I shouldn't have included that line. It is disrupting things. But now I know, right? I, at the time, I probably didn't think about that sort of thing. Um, the cross hatching that I have in the nose and this eye socket is also a little distracting to me. I think one of the problems that I have with this piece is that I used black line exclusively. Now I'm not against using some black line, but when you use it exclusively, it flattens everything in a certain way. And so I'm seeing that in this piece, I'm seeing that it it's, it's holding it back because I went through and I used that harsh black line. I said earlier, I've been sketching with this kind of very deep, rich purple. And that's one reason this deep, rich purple will not flatten out quite as much as just solid black. So definitely encourage you. I mean, you don't have to, but I encourage you to pick a color when you're doing line drawings and such. Uh, it can be almost black, but if you stay away from pure black, I think it's going to help you in the long run. So, all right, let's walk down here for a second. We got two more and then, um, We'll kind of recap some of the things what we learned and such and, and do a q a and such like that okay so let's look at this very cool cat demon cat of sorts this has a really nice blend of both the chunkiness and the smoothness right so we see and this could be hard to see because it's a dark color but we see here that there is a very distinct shape form right it's almost like this pyramid -y a triangular shape. And so we can tell that there's a change of planes here, right? This is the top, and then this would be the side. We could tell that. But the artist has done such a nice job with the rendering that it doesn't feel as in your face as some of the other ones, right? It doesn't feel as chunky. It's still chunky, but it's got this rounded quality. It's, it's like chunky light almost. And that's a very nice feature. Now, if we look uh, alternatively over here, this is a very hard edge. This is a very um, 
hard plane on the edge of the uh, fur right here, which is a nice contrast. So we have a little bit of both and that's a really nice thing. The last thing I'll say about this piece is that one of the things that is, uh, it, why it's so successful is because of its silhouette. Now, last stream, somebody asked me if, uh, if some of the chunkiness and form we were going to talk about related to silhouette. And I, I hadn't even thought about that. And I really appreciated that comment because then I went back and I started a file just for silhouette. So we're going to talk about silhouette in the future. But for the time being, what I want you to note here is that if we uh, just took the silhouette of this creature, and forgive me, I'm not going to do a perfect job of the uh, silhouette because I'm doing this rough and fast so that you can see what I'm talking about. But if we take this silhouette of this creature and the tail, we could see that this shape or, or this series of shapes, this very complex shape is extremely interesting. Like look at just that silhouette. That is beautiful silhouette. And so even though the artist rendered this beautifully, even though the subject matter is interesting. If you took it down to just the silhouette, you would have beautiful shapes, beautiful curves and lines and contrast just in the silhouette. I am amazed at this piece just because of the silhouette. It's beautiful. I'm hopeful that I can get shapes quality like that into my own work in the future. But for now, we will continue along. I just wanted to point out that uh, beauty of that silhouette. Okay, this last one is by a sculptor who I had not heard of until suddenly I started coming across all these pieces that I loved that looked very similar. And so uh, this is a specific sculptor who works in clay. There are videos on his website. I'll try and post a link in the description of the recording. There are videos on his website of him working, and it is amazing. Like you just... Oh my gosh, you've got to watch these videos. They're amazing. He he starts with just lumps of stuff and then he adds more lumps and then he starts cutting away at things and suddenly there's this beautiful sculpture and it feels like it's magic almost. Um, he is he's very good in my opinion and he's got this quality where you see the planes, right? This horse is beautifully done. Uh, it's got curves. It's got those sort of line quality it's obviously doesn't have line work in it, but it's got those lines that are just beautifully done, but also it has distinctive planes. It's very chunky and it's very dimensional. And so it's a really, a really nice piece that is uh, 3D or it's, it's literally clay. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this one's clay because it seemed like that's exclusively what he works in, but it's, it's beautiful. And I, I have a thing for horses in general. They're so majestic and so elegant in their lines. And by lines, I mean, you know, the form and the flow. So this piece speaks to me in general. Okay, so that's a little bit about the uh, analysis and the application of chunkiness in form. Let's go over a couple of things that we, we, what we learned today. All right, first of all, one thing that I hadn't considered before is that when you use those more straight lines, the definitive confident change in plane it tends to definitely read as chunky in a sense. And so that's a nice aspect. I'm not saying we only have to use uh, straight lines. If we look at that first piece where we discovered this, there are plenty of soft and curving lines. You know, they're all over the place and that's fine. But when we have the hard straight lines, it does seem to lend itself to that sort of chunkiness. Okay, uh, next up, if we were going to uh, kind of go over the things that, that we, we learned today is that I guess I would say that you can, you can do this sort of thing with both line and with just differing tones. However, it seems to me that for the most part, like this one would be the only example that's, that's probably flying in the face of what I'm going to say, but it seems like for the most part, you don't want too much line, right? So if I'm going to incorporate line, I have to keep in mind that I'm not here outlining every shape. 
I already knew that, but it's something that I definitely want to drive home as I'm continuing. Uh, we see that example up here a lot. The line use is limited. And we, we kind of almost fall back on using tone to differentiate form. So that's a really important aspect that we want to keep in mind. And then, then I think the other thing to kind of think about is that in a way, the more contrast you have between the tones, the chunkier it almost feels. Because when you have two tones next to each other that are not high contrast, so for example, if we look at the lips of this character, this bottom lip definitely has, you know, a plane change on the lip. We have like the bottom part of the lip and then we have this part at the top. And so there's definitely a plane change, but these tones are so closer, are, are closer together than say these tones of the skin and the top lip. And as a result, this top lip feels a lot chunkier in a sense. It feels a lot um, harder almost. Uh, whereas the tones together, uh, when, they're, when they're closer together, it tends to soften it a bit more, it seems like. And I think that that, that kind of goes throughout the different pieces. When you have less contrast, you're going to have that kind of softer element. So that's interesting. All right. Cool. So I'm going to add those notes to my overall notes and we will uh, we'll kind of continue to analyze and continue to add things to the bits and pieces of stuff. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to um, open up Q&A time while we're wrapping up for today. If I can find the little ticker thing. There it is. Okay. So let me shut down the old iPad for now, and we will go into a brief Q&A if anybody's interested, if anybody wants to um, chat about anything that we talked about today, that we learned today, something completely off topic if you want, I suppose we can always do that too. Uh, and we can just kind of chat for the last few minutes of today's live stream. It's kind of a shorter one, which makes sense because as I said, this is still kind of a learning process for me too. Uh, I was much more comfortable with the idea of the proportion uh, analysis. And I was much more comfortable with the line analysis. But for me, form has always been a challenge. It's been a struggle for me. I don't think necessarily in 3D shapes. I've I've done enough study now and I've, I've talked to enough artists to recognize that some artists just kind of see in 3D shapes. That's not me though. I see in very flat forms typically. Like if I picture something in my head, I don't see where like a wireframe model around it would be. If I go and take a piece and I try and like trace contours and things, I get lost really quickly because my brain just doesn't, it just doesn't seem to interpret things in that same way. So when it comes to form, I'm going to have some challenges ahead. I recognize that already because I have done this long enough to know that this is one of my areas where I have to work extra hard. It, it's just kind of what it is. It, it is what it is. Uh, and that's okay. You know, you, you get there if you keep at it. But I didn't keep at it for most of my life. I just quit in this particular realm. That's why I stuck with 2d newspaper style comic art for my whole life was because the other stuff was hard and i was like well this is easy so i'll do the easy thing instead of the hard thing and now well a little bit paying for it because now i'm i'm having to do it now but that's okay because you can always start you can always start you can if you quit for however many years whatever it is you can always start back up and it might be more painful but it's worth doing all right um don't see a lot of questions in the chat. I, oh, wait, maybe one come up. Oh, okay. Well, it's not really a, a question, but we'll, we'll, we'll say it anyway. It says, hi, I joined late, uh, but genuinely thought this was pre-recorded because of how helpful it seemed. Like if it was really a YouTube video, definitely following. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad that it was useful and I'm glad that it seemed less live streamy in a way. I, I have nothing against live streams, but I want to, I want to offer you guys useful things, right? Like I want to be useful to you because otherwise I'm just sitting here rambling and I could do that without the camera on. 
I could just sit here and talk to myself if I really wanted to. Right. Um, so what I typically do is a day or two before a live stream, I will prepare the material. I'll even run through at least half of it. I try and leave the analysis part to do live so that there's that element of spontaneity. But the lecture part, I will try and at least briefly rehearse so that I'm not rambling because I tend to ramble. But I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And, and that really makes me happy because it means that what I'm doing is working in the way that I wanted to. Uh, Le Bon Carr says, really interesting live. Thank you for your work. When will the next live be? So that's a great question. Uh, we're still, or I, I'm still kind of working through that. Ferdinand has a crazy schedule. So his live streams typically are Thursday, Friday, or Saturday uh, weekly. But because that guy's so busy, I mean, it's just bonkers how busy he is. I know that sometimes it's just he has to get some other work for clients and things done, or he has to take a minute to step back and spend time with family because that's super important too. So I'm trying to decide or figure out when my live streams will be, and I'm trying to keep them regular for you guys, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. That's not always possible. Sometimes I might have to cancel one, but I'm trying. So I'm thinking that this 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time time uh, frame works well for my schedule. I'm thinking that probably Monday, this coming Monday, which if I look at the calendar real quick, uh, that would be Monday the 13th of March. I'm thinking that then we might we might tackle the next live stream Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. What the topic of that live stream will be, I'm not sure. If I look into my upcoming analysis that I need to do, we have things like backgrounds, we have compelling story or curiosity. We've got lighting. Uh, now there's an addition of silhouette that wasn't there before. Um, I have femininity, which I think is a very interesting topic and kind of goes with the female proportions that we talked about before. Uh, colors, uh, there's a lot there. We're going to talk a lot about colors. That's another area that I'm going to learn alongside because I worked almost exclusively in black and white for most of my life. And then uh, what else? We have female faces. I do want to, that, that may be the next one uh, because I was doing some, I did a live stream on Wednesday that was just kind of like a live stream mini uh, uh, light version where I was just working on drawing some fan art for fun and practice. And what I realized was I need to wrap my head around faces more because a lot of my art's probably going to be character driven. So it might be good to analyze that. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. We'll, we'll kind of figure that out. Uh, Hailey says, I'd like to hear more about backgrounds sometime. I think that that's also a good one that's going to have to come up pretty soon because backgrounds are a fascinating topic. And again, that's another area where I'm going to have to work extra hard because backgrounds in a newspaper comic are like, look, this little line represents a kitchen counter. You can kind of tell I'm putting a coffee pot on it. Therefore, it's a kitchen counter. So it's very different than if you want to do a full illustration with a beautiful background. So definitely we'll, we'll try and, and get that uh, going as well. Oh, I see. Now we're getting all these, these questions and, and comments now that things are over, which is good. That, that's, when we, that's why we set this time aside for it. Uh, Azure says, which also really played into the more rounded examples. Apologies. You probably are referencing something that I've said, and I don't know where that was, lined up with <laughs> as I'm going back. Um, uh, Mio says, have you worked in the industry? If so, how long, if you don't mind my asking? No, absolutely. All, all questions are on the table, pretty much. Um, so, yes, I have worked in the industry. Uh, freelancer. I have had a few art jobs uh, for studios and things, but I found early on in my career and life that I don't I don't do as well in an office environment as I do either working from home or working outside even, or just in general. So freelance life uh, fit me much better than working in an office, which is why most of my industry experience is more along the lines of the freelance. And if so, how long? I have been at this for a very long time. <laughs> um, I think my first professional paid gig was for a 
friend of mine's dad designing a logo for his company. And that was probably 22 years ago or so. Maybe if my math is correct, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 years. I've been doing art my whole life, but professionally, I probably started about 22 years ago, uh, which now I feel old. So thanks for that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So that's, it's been a while. Um, Papa Goose says, I vote for Silhouette. Uh, okay. Well, now we're getting some votes, but yeah, I, I'm going to kind of try and figure out um, what will fit best, not only with the flow of what we've been talking about, but also I do need to keep in mind that whatever's going to push me forward in my own work is, is going to be important. So I need to kind of tackle that at the same time, but I will keep in mind that you're, you're voting for Silhouette. So I will try and at least move that upwards on the list as we go forward. Uh, okay. And then last, I think we'll go, we'll go with the last question for the day and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Mio asks, do you have any tips for artists starting out freelancing? You bet. That's, that's one of my areas of expertise. So we could talk about that. All right. So what, what order do we talk about things? Okay. For starters, let's talk just briefly about uh, working for free because that's kind of a hot topic in art uh, and everybody kind of has their own opinion and some people will say no never and some people will say oh absolutely and things like that I will tell you that for me when I started out I did a lot of projects for free I did um, some of them were for fellow artists they weren't even for massive companies because honestly a massive company should be able to pay you but you will grow as an artist if you take on some sometimes free work for projects you want to do. Uh, a very good example, which is near and dear to all of us, is that I met Ferdinand because he approached me about helping with an animated short that he was doing. He was like, I really like your work with FredTheMonkey.com. I think that's what it came from. Will you come and do, the, do, a, do a, a shot or two of this animated short I'm doing? And there was no pay involved. It was just an artist asking another artist. And I said, you know what? Sure, let's do it. And so I did. And now we've had this, what, 15 year long friendship. I don't even know how long it's been. It's been forever. I've gone, I visited him in Germany. He's come to the US. We've hung out here. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And that whole thing, uh, Animator Island itself probably wouldn't have happened if I hadn't taken on that one free project for a fellow artist. So don't, in the beginning especially, do not rule out doing some free work. Uh, it's okay. You're not, you don't want to do that forever, but in the beginning, it's okay to do that some of the time. It's okay. Um, in terms of companies though, you know, set, set reasonable rates for your skill level. That's a thing you'll figure out as you go. But in general, um, in terms of getting freelance work, which I think a lot of people struggle with, I have never had that problem so it's harder for me to speak to i don't know what it is about me but people will literally come up to me and offer me work <laughs> like i i i was once at a museum art gallery showing which is the weirdest one in my opinion i was in this museum art gallery and i'm looking at a piece and i'm kind of studying it and this older lady comes up to me and says what do you think of this and so i started telling her all the different things that i thought about it in the different forms and stuff She's like, oh, you must be an artist. And I was like, yeah, actually I am. She's like, well, here, let me give you my card because I have something that I need done or something. And just like out of nowhere, she just basically gave me a job and, and it was weird. Uh, but that seems to happen a lot. So maybe put yourself out there, um, you know, because nobody knows that you are looking for work or you're, you're a freelance artist if you don't talk to them about it. Uh, so, so be open about that sort of thing. Um, uh, I think that that helps to get jobs, but it's, it's a hard life. It's not, it, especially when it comes to the finance aspect of things, it's hard. Sometimes you're going to need a, what you would call regular job on the side. Like I've done a bunch of regular jobs too. I'm also very fortunate because my wife is a software engineer, as I think I mentioned. And so there's no shortage of work for software engineers too. So, and we also live very frugally. So there's a lot of things, the moving parts, but if you want to do it, if you want to be a freelance artist, go for it. Like try. It's it's worth trying and worth doing. 
Uh, it might work, it might not work, but the trying really matters. So as you're starting out, just keep that in mind. There's going to be a lot of rejection. There's going to be a lot of work, but it'll get smoother as you go and you'll get more experience and it'll be, it'll be good stuff. So keep at it. You'll do it. All right. Um, oh, all right. Last one. I swear this for realsies this time. Um, Oh, actually, wait, I just clicked the wrong one. Now there's two more. All right. La one last question. Do you have a Discord server? We do not have an Animator Island Discord server at the moment. Um, hoping to set up one for Weekend Panda, which is the game studio that my wife and I have. Uh, and there probably will be an art section of that. But I will talk to Ferdinand if he's interested in a Discord server, because uh, I know a lot of folks do that sort of thing. And here's the last one that I was actually saying was the last one. Azure says, I had to split my last comment into two parts because character limits, character limit. It was supposed to be with a comment right before highly. So if we go back to the comment right before highly, uh, bah, bah, bah. Um, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, if, if it's a particular question or comment, uh, Azure, leave, uh, leave it on the YouTube page, if you wouldn't mind, because I'd love to know what what it was. I'm sorry, I'm not piecing it together, but I'd love to 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 see it or hear it. And that goes for everybody. If you have a question that you don't get answered in the chat uh, or during one of the live streams, you're always welcome to leave a comment. We we try very hard to check YouTube and the comment section now and then and, and just respond when we can. So definitely check that out. Okay, cool beans. Well, thanks again, everybody, for stopping in and watching today's live stream. Again, right now, uh, the next one is going to be, the next official full live stream, for me at least, is going to be this coming Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'm not sure what the topic is yet, but if you stay tuned, we will have that topic revealed, hopefully, the day before, or because I do need to prep for it. And then probably... Either Ferdinand or I will have some kind of live stream minis, a watch me work sort of things, where if we're working on a piece, we might open up the uh, streaming and just kind of hang out and chat. So always look for forward to that. But those are going to be typically a little less structured than than these official, well, not official ones, but these the ones that have the lecture and the application and stuff. Uh, they'll be the ones that are a little more heavy duty and... Uh, and Ferdinand will probably be back with another one of those kind uh, related to animation soon too, because he's done a bunch of those. Check through the old live tab on YouTube. There's a lot of great content that he's done over the last, uh, well, long time now, but there's a lot of really good stuff there that he's done in live stream form. So check it out. Okay, that's all I've got for today. So as, as Ferdinand would say, keep on animating and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.